Hey everyone, I just wanted to briefly showcase what I have planned for Booth Street. Now I have a meeting tomorrow with the uh, city traffic engineering department and we're going to meet in the afternoon at Booth Street at about, I believe it's uh, yeah 2.30 p.m. Um, but I would like to share what I have prepared for them so that way, once we have the tour, uh, everyone else is on board with what I'm doing and I want to get some feedback. Uh, so let's take a look at what Booth currently has as far as a problem. And I would also argue as far as Idlewild and Foster, this entire corridor here, there's a few ambiguous areas that need resolving. And here's my recommendation for the city. So this is Booth Street. It's a north and south street. It's been around for over 100 years. And what it does is it comes down from where California is, goes north and south, and then goes across the river here at the Booth Street Bridge, and then makes a 90 degree turn and turns into uh, Riverside Drive. Now, along this corridor, there are some bike lanes. There are also some areas that are marked for uh, pedestrian safety uh, as you get closer to the school. It is, it's a school zone. Um, if anyone has taken on a, uh, has taken a bike on this corridor, they'll know that the, the southbound bike lanes are pretty solid. They're pretty intact. Now at every intersection here, like for instance, this inlet for the parking lot for the school and this, uh, inlet over here for the federal building, um, the bike lanes stop and then they start again and then they stop and start again. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what standard this was made by. There should at least have some uh, some dashed lines here to, to at least let people know that, hey, there is a lane here. Watch out for them. Um, but that's not happening. The big problem that I have been uh, pointing out to the city has been on the northbound lane where when you merge. So if you're going southbound, by the way on California Street, there is no bike lane. But if you make a turn here, then suddenly there is one. So this bike lane kind of starts out from the corner here, um, doesn't have a protected intersection here. So for instance, if you're in the bike lane going northbound on California and you want to merge onto the bike lane over here, you cannot stay over in the bike lane and have a protected uh, left turn. You have to merge into car traffic into their lane and then make that turn and you're going north on Booth from there. And from there, you're also passing a couple of uh, side streets here. This larger one with that has a lot of paint on it is Foster, Foster Drive. And that originally was meant to be an arterial uh, street that before the 1960s, basically what happened was uh, Keystone, which comes down this direction here, was meant to curve and turn into Foster here, which then would become an arterial and who knows where they had originally planned it to go from here. But at this point, it's this big fat road, lots of room, and it terminates at Idlewild Drive. So it appears that at some point that plan to create this arterial road Probably, maybe it was to connect across the street here to 4th Street. It could have been. That would have made some sense because that would have created this entire super block here. Uh, but that's not the case. It just terminates. Okay. So people started using California and Keystone and Mayberry as the arterials to head down south and continue on until uh, McCarran. So this super, super block actually kind of became larger, but there's no... This kind of uh, it turned into like a residential community area here. OK, um, just no, and also for reference, so people know what I'm talking about, because it might come up. This substation here, this power substation used to be the power plant for Reno. It used to be a hydroelectric power plant. That's why Idlewild Park exists. And that's why Riviera um, exists. This street or it's not even a street here, this this easement that you see here coming down at this very odd uh, diagonal uh, shape there used to be a canal to feed water into the hydroelectric power plant. I would also imagine that the street that goes up and down through Idlewild Park also was a canal at one point. And these existed prior to Idlewild Drive existing. 
So that's why they kind of both point in the direction of this hydroelectric power plant. And then later, as the grid connected to larger grids, uh, uh, sources for, for energy, they probably downgraded this to a mere substation. And once the, uh, once I forgot what it was called. Um, it wasn't the World Fair. It was another fair. And by 1928, this was, um, this what is now a park, uh, got turned into a park after that fair. It was the same fair where we showcased the Reno Arch, the original Reno Arch. Okay, so that's a little bit of background as to how this area became like it is. It's kind of funky. Also, if you look at some historic aerial photography, you can notice that um, this area here where the Truckee River flows around this hump, this has actually changed and diverted course a couple of times. Uh, we actually prior to the uh, prior to the river kind of being pushed in, funneled through a certain trajectory, our river actually used to uh, meander a lot more than it does now. So uh, that's why this area here was not developed for a long time and is now it's it's still on the the low water area. Um, but it's pretty much exactly where you see it now. If you look at uh, the 1948 map from historic aerials, you'll see that it actually used to uh, take a slightly different course there. So that was not fully under control even back then, you know, way more so than it is now. So let's get back to the actual Booth Street conundrum that we have here. As you're going north on Booth, you'll see that there is a bike lane. And it continues on and it continues on and continues on bike lane past the entrance to uh, Keystone. And then it goes past the uh, federal building, the IRS building, and it goes through this red zone here. And then suddenly, whoa, WTF, we have cars parked in what is supposed to be a bike lane. And suddenly it ends. And you're like, wait a minute, are they parked illegally? What's going on here? Um, I've made a video on this. I have not actually, I'm sorry. I am in the middle of making a video on this. I took some footage live talking about this issue and I, I examined the area. There is no red parking zone. There's no, uh, red zone for this area. This is allowed on street parking. So what's going on here? Now imagine that was a bike lane. There is an additional problem that's happening is that when you get to the Booth Street Bridge, which has been around for over a century now, I believe, when you get to this bridge at the end of this and you have this 90 degree turn, suddenly this lane ends. There's no signage. There's no warning. It just kind of dumps out in the middle of a curve. And there's another problem here. Let me go to the to the street view of this so that way you can see where the uh, hopefully you'll be able to, to see it a little bit more. Um, this portion of the curb is higher in elevation than this opposite side of the street. So that means that it's banked and sloped against the curve. So what happens when you're trying to make a curve and you're heading up or down over this bridge is that your bike or your motorcycle or whatever, your scooter is tilting the opposite direction. It's tilting to the left, which is kind of dangerous because if you're, you have to really slow down in order to keep your balance on your bike. Otherwise, you can end up toppling over. And if there's oncoming traffic, you're going to hit, hit, hit the traffic that's happening. Um, so this area was very vague in the first place. Additionally, if, and here's someone using it as a bike lane and they're about to hit ambiguity land here. Wow. That's kind of, uh, uh, cons uh, uh auspicious that it happened to be. So it looks like maybe at one point it continued on as a bike lane, but then when they paved the concrete, it got tucked underneath that. Uh, so there could be existing, bike infrastructure that's underneath here to help things through. But then who knows, maybe they just didn't uh, fix it up once they re-slurry the road. That could be the case. That would make a little bit of sense, but that's not the case now. So is this a bike lane or is this not a bike lane? Remember, as we were heading up this way, suddenly uh, you have to you have to pray that there are no cars here. Um, so I'm going to show another problem here that there is a sign that suddenly says share the road. Does that mean that there's no bike lane here? It doesn't make sense. It just kind of, it's very ambiguous. There's a bike lane one block over here, but right here, there is no 
bike lane and this person's parked backwards. <laughs> That's funny. So yeah, there's parking here. It's allowed. I had parking enforcement arrive and spoke with him briefly on camera. And he said he's not going to issue a citation because it's not clear as to whether or not there's supposed to be a bike lane or not. And I agree with him. They shouldn't issue citations unless traffic engineering actually handles this problem properly. So this is the case as we have it. And the, the other thing, too, by the way, is across the street, we have a red zone, but yet it looks like there's supposed to be parking in between. So technically, the bike lane is like in a door zone. Uh, that could be uh, resolved as well. Now, this parcel right here that is open, that doesn't have any development on it. This is a very old parcel. Uh, you can tell because you can kind of see where the old uh, stone retaining wall still exists there. And this is where the road starts getting tighter. So you can see that south of here, it gets wider. And then as you get closer and closer to, uh, to Keystone in California, it gets even wider after this intersection here. So you have more and more and more room. But as you approach the Booth Street Bridge, it funnels and gets tighter and is very kind of ambiguous so there's like we have less room to put stuff we have less room to put stuff and pretty soon we're sharing the road and all we have is a two-lane road that has ambiguous lanes on either side that could be used as parking but also can be used as a bike lane what's going on so here's my proposal to solve this entire problem and additionally it'll solve Another problem that's happening, which is there's a lot of uh, traffic congestion and it's not very safe for people going to Reno High School on their bikes because it's pretty much Strode territory. Remember, it was built as an arterial. The sidewalks on either side of Foster are four feet wide, which is barely ADA compliant. And yet we have this very fat roadway that we could do a lot of stuff with. So there's parking on either side. We have one lane of traffic either way. And even though it is illegal for cars to pass one another during school hours when people are dropping off and picking up, we have a median here. Why is that? If you're not allowed to pass each other, why are we designing the road in a way that allows people to pass one another? So we have lots of problems here. An additional uh, problem here that I can see is that this is not a raised crosswalk. Going across the street, this means that we only have yield lines telling people where they have to yield for people crossing the street here, but there could be a raised crosswalk here which, I, <laughs> once again, this is not an arterial road, so that means it should be paved and created to be a safe place for, for, for kids, you know, 18 year olds, but still, you know, students. Okay. Um, as you get over here to Hunter Lake, it starts calming down a bit. The North and South here is a pretty tight corridor here and that it's pretty calm. Um, from what I've seen, uh, Idlewild drive real quick, by the way, Idlewild is pretty wide. It's an older street. It's, uh, around, it comes from around the 1930s as the earliest maps that I've seen any mention of Idlewild Drive, um, but it's pretty wide. So it has parking on either side. There is no meeting in the middle. It has a striped lane, uh, a striped uh, yellow uh, dash down the middle. So people can pass each other on this area. And uh, the actual corridor for cars, though, is pretty wide. We're talking maybe like 12 feet of room, which is suitable for something that should be 30, 35, 40 miles an hour. But yet this is a small residential community here. And this is also doubled as the Truckee uh, River Path or the Tahoe Pyramid Bike Trail. So this is a bike boulevard and yet it is shaped and paved like it's not safe for cars, for, for, for bicycles. The only speed table that I see here is right here where they have the intersection to, to go into the, the park area and that's it. The rest of it is pretty flat. So there's not a lot of speed calming on this entire area here. They do have this little divider here uh, so that way people cross in this uh, to get to and from the, the park here. And there's another one that's over here. Let's see where it's at. Once you get to Riviera Street, there's another one. And it's past that. There we go. Here's the one right there. It's kind of sort of half-assed. It's like, yeah, you want you to kind of slow down, but it, look how large this intersection is where Riviera is. Yeah, this is where the canal used to come in for the hydroelectric uh, power plant right there. Uh, additionally, we have some, uh, some uh, <laughs> other problems here. Real quick, I'll just note um, the bike path right here, which is uh, nicknamed the Crooked Mile, it predates... Idlewild Drive, it says no bicycles on pathway, no bikes allowed on the bike path. 
Why? Because the neighbors nearby, uh, I talked to one of the neighbors. She said, yes, we were having a problem with bikes overtaking us as we were walking our dogs. Well, I'm very sorry, madam, but you are on a bike path. That's to be expected. It's a shared use path and it is pretty uh, narrow. I would say it's about maybe six feet wide at its widest up until you get to the part where this actual park begins. But this, the park, it does begin here, by the way. When I say when the park begins, I'm getting closer to like the parking facilities over here. This sign right here, this, this post, it's very difficult to read. You can't see it, but this says Truckee River bike path. And you see this little area that is, it looks like it's darker right there. Someone took uh, a penny or something and scratched out the part where it says bikes are allowed. <laughs> so the signage is conflicting. Also, we have a curb at the end of this bike path, which means that bikes cannot merge onto the traffic lanes if they wanted to take this path for bikes. So you're stuck on this four foot wide. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's like it's this is not a bike path here. So when this got paved in in the 1990s, somewhere around there. Uh, the city of Reno's solution to fixing up this traffic area to keep vehicles from getting onto this road was just to put a curb there instead of like flattening it out and putting some bullards and having uh, filtered permeability for, for different micro modes. No, nope, they didn't do that. They just put a curb. They also did the same thing on the other termination point of the Crooked Mile on the other side of it. I've looked at some historic aerial maps of this area as well, and this portion of the Crooked Mile also terminates into a curb. However, in the maps that I have looked at, this actually used to be the road that went into the park. Like I said, it predates Idlewild Drive. So this curbed off road, which is now used as a bike path, um, was the road to get into the park once upon a time. And then in the 1990, somewhere between 1984 and 1990, or between 80 and 94, because there's a gap in the maps, I don't know exactly when it happened, there was a curb that was placed here. So that means that anyone using the bike path, the Truckee River path, has a four, four or five foot, I think it's five feet here, five foot wide uh, sidewalk that they have to share with pedestrians, which is practically impossible to do when you have an event going on. It could be anything from food truck Fridays to Earth Day or anything, and you have tons of cars parked here. So you have to get off your bike and walk it. And then you have to walk across. I have footage of this. You walk across the street in traffic, get into your lane and then start biking again. So that way you're on the road. It's crazy. It makes no sense whatsoever. So this entire area is kind of funky. It's kind of messed up. And then when you get over here, someone's using the sidewalk to, to bike. That's kind of funny. Um, yeah, every, every shot that it is taken is taken at a different time. So it's kind of hard to see kind of the contiguous, uh, chronological experience here. Additionally, I want to point something else out here uh, because I'm, I'm kind of setting up the, the entire thing for what my solution is to this. If you continue taking Riverside Drive here to what is currently known as Zero Riverside Drive, uh, this area had been slated for condominiums years ago, but that plan fell through. And now they're looking into creating um, uh, high density, uh, low cost apartments at this area across the alleyway from this uh, 1960s development here. There is a public access easement that goes up to Jones Street, which is perfect for bicycles and perfect for slow vehicular traffic. It's just like your alleyway system that you have in Midtown. And you have this little kind of uh, little stub of Riverside that leads to and from it, which is very, very cool for stopping, you know, taking a breath on your bike and before you head down either up or down, um, you know, the street here. OK, so what's my solution? What's my proposal for this? My recommendation? I recommend that we have a two way bike highway that goes side by side with the street that goes along Idlewild and goes up and down Booth and goes up and down Foster. So this is what it would look like. Um, we have a two way path and we also have a, a 10 foot wide sidewalk next to that along Foster. 
And this is what it looks like is all the trees are there and everything. And we have continuous sidewalk that goes across the inlet. So that way people coming in and out of the parking lot have to slow down. We still have plenty of parking space. When I mean parking, this can also be converted into loading zones for buses, uh, people dropping and off, picking up uh, 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 students along the way. We have gotten rid of the median. That was not needed and is a double solid line going all the way up and down Foster because it's a school zone. You're not supposed to pass one another. OK, so we've taken care of that problem. As you get to the intersection here, this intersection is where a lot of changes have happened, where I put bike signals for people going north and south on Booth. And then we also have. Um, I forgot what these are called, but it's when you bring the sidewalk way out. So we're talking about 20 feet of room just for people crossing this crosswalk here. However, it still makes a convenient wide turn for buses, making this turn so that way they can head into Foster Drive if they're heading westbound. Um, the school zone uh, signs are shown here exactly where, as where they are currently. Um, the left and right turn lanes are kept exactly the way that they are, except that this has changed a little bit here because there's no more median. So that so this one lane handles both uh, going forward and making a turn onto booth. And as you get on the booth here, first of all, this inlet, we have a yield line to let uh, cars know that they are crossing into an area that has a bike path and a 10 foot wide sidewalk. And right here is where the bus stop is. So this will be a floating bus stop for RTC for the number 16 bus line. And it continues this way to where you have the rear parking lot, which I believe is for, um, for, the, uh, for the faculty. And so what we have here is we have a left turn lane that has a yield line that says, okay, you must wait for oncoming traffic. And then you must also wait for any bike traffic going back and forth here. And then you have, so basically they're going up in elevation by 2% grade or whatever they call it. It's like 2%. Uh, I got to learn more about that terminology. I've heard the word use, uh, used 2% grade. Okay. Whatever that means. So whatever that is, basically they're going up the sidewalk level and they're, they're going across a continuous sidewalk and that makes it safer for walkability. Okay. That's, that's what the whole purpose for that is. As you get closer to booth, first of all, there is a continuous sidewalk or a uh, raised crosswalk, whatever you want to call it right here. This is what that uh, kind of darkish red area is to kind of show you that this is a, this is raised up to the level of the crosswalk. So that way school kids coming from this apartment building here have cars slow down for them rather than the other way around. And this is right within, and I'm, I'm telling, I'm going to tell uh, the city to extend the school speed limit area right past this, this area that I told you that is uh, not developed. That's where the school zone should begin and end with um, uh, yield lines there. And then uh, with a yield sign also telling people to slow down for, for, uh, for pedestrian traffic crossing over from this, um, from this apartment complex here. And then when you get to the corner, this is another big one right here. This entire intersection is raised up. In other words, the, cars go up to the sidewalk level and just like in Dutch intersections, it creates a walkable bikeable zone where it basically tells cars you're suddenly coming to a pedestrian prime zone. They have primacy. They have priority. Slow down. And this would be a safety zone. So it'll go down to at least 20 miles an hour for regular street traffic. The yellow D the letter D here that you see on three things, those are where the drainage currently are. They would have to be moved a little bit. So this drainage thing would probably need to move on to one moment. Drainage would probably either have to move. Come on. Oh, it's that's why I couldn't get a hold of it. There we go. It'd probably either over here or move it over here. But this area would be higher up. So there's your drainage. Okay. So that would be fixed up. This drainage area is exactly where it is currently. So there would be no problem there. Um, and then you got Booth Street Bridge. Now, if this map on Booth Street Bridge, if, if I had just a little bit more room to paint what I would do here, um, I'm going to go back to Google Earth and you're just going to have to kind of picture it in your mind. Remember right here where, where I'm at, this is where the bike path would end the two-way path that you were, we were just looking at, this, this part here would terminate 
at the intersection of Riverside Drive next to where they're thinking about putting apartments. Why? Because that's a good place for bikes to merge onto traffic. In other words, they would have their own intersection right here where I'm looking at at the ground, right next to this crosswalk. This is this would be a place where they could make a, a protected turn and get onto the bike path here. So that way everyone has visibility of one another. The cars can see the bikes waiting to, to merge in and out. And this entire area could be fixed up for bikes. Now I just have to paint it. I have to expand the map, but I'll have to do that at a later time. I'm, a, I'm just kind of showing you, this is where uh, the bike intersection would be for the bike network. Okay, so let me go back to the map here. Let me zoom back out. And what else are we looking at? Uh, yes, uh, once again, over here on Foster, uh, uh, raised crosswalk for, uh, for students. Actually, you know what? I should make that the same color that I made the other ones. I'm going to change that real quick here. So that way I can be consistent. There we go. So raised crosswalk here. And the reason why I'm making it that dark rust color is because I was keeping in mind what the Dutch do when they make raised intersections and raised crosswalks. They use bricks because bricks are permeable. That means that water can get down into the water table underneath the road beds. That way they don't have to worry about drainage because they have a lot of rain. That's how they handle their drainage problems is they create permeable surfaces for water to get into. Considering that we're right next to a bridge, I'm pretty sure there's a way they can engineer a way for water table uh, water to, to soak down into the, to the surface of this and and either flow into the uh, using some kind of a, a filtered like a like a gravel. Uh, there's like a multi-level gravel uh, um, aggregate that you can use to allow uh, surface water to get down underneath the surface and into your your water table. OK, so there is a green solution for that as well. Um, the other thing, too, about this intersection, no stop signs just yield signs. Why? Because this entire intersection is screaming out for people to stop, slow down, look left and right. Raised intersection, 20 miles an hour, yield to whoever might be coming your way. Okay. And that means bikes and pedestrians, you yield to those and they have priority to get through. So the Tahoe Pyramid bike trail would continue on this way all the way up. And then people taking the bike network to get to school. They go down this way. And then as you head to California, this is where something big is going to happen later um, in my plans, but we're not going to talk about that now. You'll have to wait until a future video. Uh, so that's about it. Um, if you have any questions, any comments, feel free to leave them in the description. Uh, get a hold of me on Twitter. I'm Ratspeed, R-A-T-S-P-E-E-D. And thank you very much for watching.